Um, yeah, so I'm uh, going to, I resisted putting any math or any kind of, you know, my, my tendency is to jump to the hardcore algorithms and, and mathy stuff, so I, it's going to be pretty high level, so I just want to set expectations here. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, just the work that we do uh, in our group, uh, kind of the problems that we face, the, the, you know, the, the things that uh, uh, dictate how we think about these types of problems and so on, and, and I hope you get, uh, I hope it's interesting to you guys. Uh, so, you know, AI is everywhere. It's affecting every aspect of our life, and as it becomes more ubiquitous in our lives, there's a strong desire to push it to the edge. I mean, why do we want to push AI to the edge? There are many, many different good reasons to do it. Uh, some of them are listed up here. Bandwidth is a big one. If you look at how many uh, processors and microcontrollers are being uh, deployed into the world, the rate at which these things are being deployed vastly outpaces the rate at which the ingress bandwidth of clouds is growing. So we just can't push all of that data that we're sensing in the world to the clouds. Latency is a huge deal, especially in applications where uh, safety is involved. So for example, here there's an example of a, maybe a smart bicycle helmet. I don't know if you appreciate my drawings here. Uh, but uh, you know, if you need some Something that has to reply can't afford that, uh, you know, one or two or three hundred millisecond round trip to the cloud. You need to be faster than that. Uh, reliability and availability are big deals. Uh, if you go to Costco and you see these smart security cameras for your home, one of the you know most asked questions is really, but I need to be connected to the cloud for this thing to detect people coming up to my my doorstep. If it's the UPS delivery guy or someone trying to break in, uh, you only detect people if it's connected to the cloud, right? So if you lose your connection to the cloud, you have no. Uh, security from these cameras. And if you think about a truck like this one, if it's trying to do some predictive maintenance or any kind of uh, AI on the truck and it's going through the desert or it's going through some, some dead zone, I don't know if there's 4G or 5G everywhere, so you need to be able to have the AI on the edge. Uh, privacy and compliance are huge reasons to push AI to the edge, right? I mean, um, think about smart toys. Uh, think about smart buildings where you want to count how many people are in each room, and computer vision is a great way to do that, but you don't want to stream live video from your entire building into the cloud, especially if you want to maybe sense how many people are using each one of the restrooms in the building, right? A smart building, you're going to send a cleaning crew to the restroom that's being used more often. Uh, live streaming live video from each one of the stalls seems like it would be a, a privacy uh, problem, and you want to do that uh, uh, AI on the edge. Uh, compliance is kind of the legal aspect of privacy. And then the last category that I think about is disconnected devices. So maybe think of an AI, like a smart hearing aid that's embedded inside my, my ear canal. I don't know if that thing is going to... Uh, or budget to go off and, and have a, a, a 4G or a 5G radio to talk to, to some other uh, device. So you want everything to happen on board. So these are the, the good reasons to do uh, AI on the edge. And then we face a bunch of challenges when we do this, right? So many systems people in the room, uh, many experts on these topics, uh, you know, more expertise than me. Uh, you want to talk about what happens when there's an unreliable connection to the cloud. Uh, federated and distributed learning is this idea that you want to somehow collect all the information from all of your sensors and, you know, learn one big uh, mega model. But then on the other hand, you want to personalize. You want each one of these devices to be able to personalize. There's a warm start problem when you, uh, you know, devices enter your ecosystem. Privacy, again, is a big deal. You want to do private inference. You want to do private training. Uh, many, many different challenges, but the one that I'd like to talk to you about today is the one that you know, I've been working on for the past couple of years, which is this idea of compressing the AI model. So a lot of our edge devices are resource-constrained devices, and our big state-of-the-art machine learning models are just too big in, in, in various senses of the word big, and we'll talk about that in a minute, uh, to fit on these devices. So I'd like to describe uh, my work and my group's work in this area. We take one approach. Uh, there are uh, various different approaches to solve this problem, so I'll tell you about what we're doing. I'll try to contrast that a little bit with the other approaches. Um, so this is what we'll talk about. So we'll, we're building a compiler. So we're building a compiler called L. Uh, what is L? Is L is a cross-compiler for AI pipelines, uh, which is specialized for resource-constraint target platforms. So this is something that takes an AI pipeline. Let's say it's an Onyx file or some description of an AI pipeline. You'll compile it. Typically, I'll do this maybe on my laptop, so not on the target device which is really uh, low, um, you know, is a resource constrained device. But on the other hand, I also don't want to compile it on a big cluster of giant GPUs. So maybe I'll compile it on my laptop and this will generate some, uh, an, an executable which executes that model in the target machine code of the target platform. And this is something that I'll deploy into the target platform and run there, right? So this is kind of the very, very simple schematic of, of what a compiler uh, does. Um, click, just a quick, kind of synopsis of, of the project. Uh, we've been working on this for about three years of Microsoft research. Uh, it's open source, it's been open source from day one. We started by open sourcing the empty files such that our 
bosses will never ask us, uh, you know, is it a good idea to open source it? It was just open source from the beginning. Uh, this is available right now. In addition to the compiler tool chain, uh, we also offer uh, various tutorials and a, a gallery of models. Uh, the idea being that people, you know, will find it very easy to just download this and consume this and, 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 and use this in their projects and so on. Uh, we do have an application focus because we need to demo our work and you know, we have managers at Microsoft and, and just telling them about how wonderful a compiler is isn't enough. They want to see things actually work. So we did have to, to choose a few key scenarios. However, the compiler is a general purpose compiler. It should be able to do everything. Uh, but what we'd like to focus on or what we've been focusing on the last couple of years uh, is ARM CPUs. So we're looking at the Cortex-A and Cortex-M family of ARMs and we want to deploy AI models onto that. We're now moving to embedded GPUs. So for example, on a Raspberry Pi 3, in addition to four Cortex-A53 um, cores, CPU cores, there's also a Broadcom video core GPU on there. And we want to use everything that's available to us. So we're now uh, also starting to adopt embedded GPUs. There's no CUDA. Uh, there's no easy way to program these things. Um, and, and you know we have to build all that f uh, for ourselves. The two application domains that we've chosen for ourselves is uh, we're looking at computer vision style problems, image net or, or detection style problems on the Raspberry Pi 3 and the Raspberry Pi 0. So these are kind of the high end of our, of our resource constrained devices. And then we're also looking at audio keyword detection on Cortex-M devices. So these are the, the, the lower power. Uh, and we're moving constantly to lower, lower power devices. Um, this is kind of the playing field, right? So on the top end, my supercomputer is a smartphone. We barely touch those, they're too powerful. This is kind of cheating. Uh, and, and if you look at these numbers, this style is maybe two years old. So instead of smartphone, this is like a, like a shitty smartphone. This is like an old smartphone. Uh, but still, too powerful for us. We don't really work on those. Again, we're doing computer vision on the Raspberry Pis, uh, Pi 3 and Pi 0. And then we're looking at audio keyword detection and smaller kind of models on, on the other end. And what's really, um, exciting for me or, or, or you know, kind of mind boggling is the spectrum of targets or, or of capabilities that I'm trying to address with this compiler, right? So there are three orders of magnitude of compute here and there are five orders of magnitude of memory, of RAM. And I want to build a cross compiler that will be able to deploy the best model onto each one of these platforms, whatever you choose. So this is our, our little playing field here. Um, this is how our compiler is designed very, very simplistically. So we have trainers, we can train from data. Typically, we don't do the full you know, backprop deep learning training inside our tool, but we leave that to the other tools, if it's TensorFlow or, or, or PyTorch or the other tools, and we'll import from a bunch of different uh, formats. You'll train your model elsewhere, and we'll pull it in to our representation. We have a computation graph representation, a, a basically an IR that we have inside our system, and then there's an optimizer that will you know, do its thing on this internal representation, and basically try to squash it down and do whatever it can to get it to you know, run on the resources that we have on the target device. Uh, in the beginning, we spent a lot of time writing these kind of assembly level uh, implementations of all of our different uh, you know, neural network uh, AI pipelines for all the different platforms we wanted to support. But uh, recently, we've put in a pretty big effort to build this uh, platform abstraction layer, which kind of sits on top of, 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 of our layer of emitters. So we can actually write cross-platform assembly, if you will, and then we have a set of emitters that will generate that or lower this down to actual machine code. Uh, we use LLVM a lot, so uh, one thing that our compiler is is a front-end into LLVM, so we'll use the fact that LLVM can generate code or machine code for a variety of different uh, architectures, but we can also bypass LLVM and emit our, our, our code in other ways, for example, using OpenCL. And then we have a number of dependencies. So again, we, we have a soft dependency on LLVM, on OpenCL, on BLAST, and on other uh, libraries. So this is typically what you'd expect from kind of an AI-specific spe uh, compiler. By the way, there are uh, quite a few uh, nowadays other efforts to compile AI for, for, for different reasons. Uh, I think we were doing it a little bit before most of these uh, newer efforts were, 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 uh, were doing it, but I think it's very encouraging to see other people kind of pick up on this idea of building a compiler for AI uh, as a solution. One thing that's special to us is the idea that we, the compiler not only knows what the model is, so, I, so I'm getting this model and I'm compiling a specific model, I'm also compiling it for a specific target. Right? So in addition to knowing the machine language that I need to output this stuff to, I need to also know how to optimize for this platform. And the way we do this is we have this uh, method of generating these profiles that represent each one of the targets that we want to um, 
emit our code to. And we do this offline. We basically create a database that represents each one of these uh, targets. And then we give that to the optimizer as a hint and saying, hey, this is what works well and doesn't work well on this specific target. Compile according to that. And I'll show you that. Uh, we'll talk about that. We'll come back to that in, in a few slides. So this is our architecture. Um, one question that I thought would be interesting to you know, kind of the uh, systems people in the room is why build a compiler, right? Most of the efforts to deploy AI in different places are building evaluation engines or AI runtimes, right? So there's, there are Onyx runtimes and other kind of runtimes. Why build a compiler, right? So I think the trade-offs are, are pretty clear. There are two, there are pros and cons to both approaches. Um, if you're a systems person, and certainly in Microsoft, when I talk to my systems friends, and they think about the Internet of Things and you know artificial intelligence of, of things, the AIoT, uh, you think about a big ecosystem. You think about a big cloud with many, many, many different IoT devices connected to it. They're heterogeneous. They have different you know types of hardwares, uh, and you have models that are trained in the cloud, and you want them to kind of move very fluently from the cloud to a device. If a device is replaced by some other kind of hardware, as long as they have you know something standard like Node.js or some runtime environment. Environment, you want it to seamlessly move from one device to another. Somehow models are constantly updating and flowing. And if that's what you're doing, what you really want is an AI runtime. You want something where you're you know, basically sending a description of a model in some very high level uh, uh, you know, description, form of description, and it just runs wherever it is. Um, this has to do with, with virtualization, with VMs. Uh, I like, and then, and then the, the, the compiler approach is much more similar to burning new firmware into a device, right? This is a static thing. You kind of have a model, you spend a lot of time optimizing and compressing it, now it, there's a representation on the microcontroller and you just put it there, right? So I think maybe of maybe a smart appliance like a smart fridge or a smart oven, this isn't something where I can you know, immediately think of an ecosystem of models flowing back and forth in the cloud. This is something that maybe I'll want to update the model once a year or once every few months, but really my, what I care about most is to optimize is to get as much performance as I can. And that's the advantage of a compiler, right? So the compiler knows what the model is, it knows what the target platform is, and you can spend a ton of time uh, before you deploy the model to optimize and get as much performance as you can, right? So the compiler is gonna give you a good performance, it's gonna give you a small executable. If you have a, a very small flash budget, for example, because you're only deploying the code that you're actually using for that specific model. If you want that interoperability, if you want to be able to seamlessly migrate from the cloud to the device, you want a runtime. And then maybe the best of both worlds is something like a just-in-time compilation scenario, right? So if you have a just-in-time compiler, maybe you can apply the types of optimizations that a compiler will build with a, with a runtime type of, of flexibility and approach. But that's not what I'm building. So, my, so you know, we're not building a just-in-time compiler, we're building a static compiler. But this is just kind of an interesting trade-off between these two alternatives. So that's a, kind of one consideration. Um, here's a pain point. So uh, one thing that we struggle with, there's a ton of research on this, right? There's a many, many papers talking about how do we do efficient um, compression of models, how do we run models on resource-constrained devices. Uh, we have three main themes of uh, you know, papers or research themes that people uh, use. So first, we have efficient architectures. This is maybe more in the neural network space, uh, but you know, that's, that's what people like to talk about today. So we have efficient neural architectures. You have a lot of papers saying, you know, if I have this kind of architecture versus that kind of architecture, then I can get a better cost accuracy trade-off. There are lossless acceleration techniques that talk about, hey, whatever model you give me, I know how to implement it without losing anything in terms of accuracy in a, in a more efficient way. And typically people do this with finding mathematical ways to reformulate the problem so that it's more efficient or just better engineering. And then there are the lossy, kind of the more exotic lossy acceleration techniques like quantization, pruning, perhaps early exit, uh, low rank approximation, and so on. So these are the four, the three types of, of, of kind of categories that we see. And a pain point is how do we compare these things? How do we know which combination of these techniques do we want to use, right? I'm trying to build a real system that people will use rather than just public, publish you know, interesting papers on this topic. How do you, how do, you do an apples to apples comparison? And, um, this brings me to a little, a little kind of gripe, a little criticism that I have for the machine learning community, which I'm, uh, you know, I'm a proud member of. Uh, this is what a typical paper on accelerating machine learning will look like, right? So you'll have a nice description of what you're, so I mean here in this example I'm talking about lossy compression techniques, but it can also be one of the other categories. So you say, hey, I have this lossy compression technique. 
Typically, they'll apply it to a very, very big redundant model, what we call a fat model. So rather than applying it to a bare bones model, you apply it to you know, a big model like a VGG or something really, really fat. Usually, you apply just one technique uniformly to the entire model, which we know is not the right way to go. And then you'll see a sentence like this. So this thing really gets me. It says, you know, um, bombastic claim with an excla exclamation point at the end, saying something like, we only lost 1% accuracy and we got a 9x speed up. And the, the, you know, the first number is supposed to sound very, very small. We only lost a little bit of accuracy and we've got this massive speed up. And then there's a big exc exclamation point. And these are sometimes true and sometimes you know, they're not reproducible. But even when they're reproducible, I don't know what this means. I don't know how to compare. I mean, one, losing 1% 1 seems like it's a little bit and 9x faster seems like it's a big speed up. I mean, it sounds OK. So I'm kind of convinced. But I don't know, could I get the same thing with trivial approaches? Could I get something with you know, a different approach? How do I even compare these two quantities? And um, I can tell you, I've, uh, now this is probably maybe my fourth year in a row being an area chair at ICML, and probably fifth time at, at NeurIPS. And because of my, my, my focus on this work, my keywords, kind of all these papers come to me. So if you're, if you're active in this field and your papers are rejected, it's probably uh, my fault. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, I'm telling you, this is what the papers look like. No one is really going for the more rigorous scientific evaluation of these things, everyone is claiming 9x, 10x, 30x. You know, you read a paper like this and you say, so what, you're telling me that the rest of us are idiots and you're 30 times better than we are? I mean, it's just not, not believable. It's, it's really a very low standard of, of, of publication. Um, and, and I think the systems folk and other, other folks in computer science have a much better way, much more rigorous way of evaluating. And, and, and I want to tell you about our efforts to adopt some of those ideas, right? So I think the key difficulty for machine learning people is that for years we've been competing on this one-dimensional competition, right? We've been thinking about just accuracy. So I have my accuracy, someone else comes on the same test set and has another accuracy, and basically we apply the simple argmax function, you know, just to see who the winner is. If my accuracy is better, I win. If, my accu if your accuracy is better, then you win. So, right, it's very, very simple. Just report accuracies on a common uh, benchmark, and let's just apply max. But this problem is inherently a two-dimensional problem. Right? So we have to think about it in two dimension, and there's really no way to linearize it into one dimension. And the first step is to agree on what accuracy and what costs really mean. Right? So this can be arbitrary. We don't really need to, to justify this as long as we agree what the playing field is. So for example, in this example, I chose a computer vision task. I told you that we like computer vision. Uh, we define accuracy as the ImageNet top one test score. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a perfectly valid thing to measure. And then we also have to agree on what cost is, right? So cost can be measured in terms of wall clock speed, flops, memory, power consumption, model size, which is also a, a legitimate thing to try to compress. It doesn't really matter as long as we agree, right? So it's well defined. And now the nice thing is that once, uh, you know, we agree on these two axes, what does cost mean and what does accuracy mean, every model just becomes a point on, in this picture, right? I don't care what kind of techniques you apply, if you use this architecture or that architecture, if you compressed it this way or that way, if you did better engineering and just implemented it better, every model has a cost and has an accuracy in a very well-defined way. And as many of you, um, you know, not from the machine learning community know, uh, how do we extend this notion of argmax? Who's the winner? What's the best model? Well, again, it's not going to be one point. This is a two-dimensional picture, so it's going to be a two-dimensional uh, kind of uh, analog of argmax, and this is just the Pareto frontier. So we have this frontier of optimality. Everything that's on the top and the left, right, the top left corner is the best place to be. I want to spend the least cost and get the most accuracy. And uh, if you're in this, uh, you know, if you're below the frontier, so every point here, for example, let's take an example, right? Every point like this one, there exists another model that's cheaper and more accurate. And then many of you may wonder why it's not a step function. Pareto frontiers often look like little step functions. Talk to me later, I'll tell you why. It's, in this case, it, it should be convex. This is not a mistake. Uh, so now we have our playing field. Uh, and let's talk about what people do. So first of all, we have architecture search. So here, we started with the most naive things you could do, right? So we're thinking about convolutional neural networks. Maybe just give it smaller images, right? Reduce the input resolution. Play with the number of layers. Change the number of filters. Use different types of interesting blocks that people have invented. Resonant blocks, bottleneck blocks, dense net blocks. Uh, and also, uh, you know, this really nice idea of depth-wise depth separable models. So just playing and doing an architecture search. Uh, and this is how our team functions. So this kind of evaluation, this is the scorecard that, you, that we use. Uh, basically, uh, members, you know, if, if you work on my team, you're not allowed to feel or express any form of happiness unless you have a model that kind of breaks through 
breaks through the line. You really want to push this thing forward. So back in January 2018, this was you know, where our Pareto frontier was. We did architecture search and, and, and worked on it. You know, had a little breakthrough in February, March, April. So this is basically how we operate. We only, you know, once we define the two axes, we just push, 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 and try to move the needle. Moving on to lossless acceleration. So we've already done a bunch of architecture search. We already have kind of our current state of the art. Uh, we, you know, started working on these convolutional models, and the folklore, the folklore was that, hey, use this thing called Winograd convolution. This is the best and fastest way to implement. We heard this at a bunch of conferences, a bunch of papers on this. Uh, and we actually studied, started a very extensive study in our group on convolution techniques. So we basically implemented everything out there in the literature. We also invented a ton of new convolution techniques ourselves. All of these are mathematically equivalent, but have different types of performance. And what we saw is that actually there is no winner. We were looking for the best convolution implementation, and there is no winner. The result really dramatically depends on what your target platform is, what, your, what the shapes of the tensors are, the output tensor and the filters, you know, how many filters you have. Uh, and then on other factors, for example, if you're relying on a BLAST implementation, which BLAST implementation it is. And we really saw huge var variation with, you know, 2x, 3x, 4x differences across the different um, um, implementations of convolution. And our solution was just choose the best one for each of the convolutions in your model. How do I know which one is the best? Well, this is where our target profiles come in. Right, so we actually have this beforehand evaluation of our platform which informs us on which convolution implementation to use. Uh, again, lossless acceleration. Uh, this is January of this year, and we've got a little bit better and better, and you know, by March we were, we're here. Here you can see that you know, the models are the, are the same. Somehow the, the, there's only this lateral movement. You just get faster and faster with the same model. So we did a lot of work on lossless acceleration. Uh, other techniques that uh, we use uh, have to do with cache efficiency, reuse of memory. This is actually where uh, the type of algorithms that you see in systems papers come up again, right? So these are scheduling problems. These are graph coloring problems to determine memory use. Uh, if you're trying to schedule in a heterogeneous hardware environment, so maybe I have a Raspberry Pi 3, and this has four ARM cores, and it has a GPU. So what part of my workload do I put on that GPU? What part do I put on the cores? Well, you know, if I'm optimizing latency, it's gonna come out to be either a shortest path or a dynamic programming kind of solution. If I'm trying to optimize throughput, if rather than just trying to call the neural network once and get the quickest result, I'm try trying to feed a stream of video through it, it's a completely different optimization, which looks more like a flow algorithm. And, and you know, we can go into that. If anyone's interested, I can tell you the details of that work that we did. Uh, but this is really similar to some of these scheduling problems that we solve in, in the cloud and in data centers and, and, and when we train and so on. Uh, virtualization, special instructions, these ARM Cortex-M4s, for example, some of them don't have floating point units, but they do have uh, you know, other special instructions that you can take advantage of and you wanna be able to, to, to pull those things in, and we did all that stuff. Uh, Moving on to lossy compression. So this is where it gets interesting. This is actually why I wanted to get into this field and I started working on it. Um, lossy compression, the techniques people, so these are like the, 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 the most sensational papers. Uh, really beautiful math, beautiful algorithms. Uh, you can do a ton of machine learning, um, you know, good research in this space. Uh, type of techniques people use, again, pruning, and sparsification. These are techniques that go 20, 30 years back. More recently, low precision uh, mathematics, quantization, binarization was big a couple years ago. Turnerization, as you saw earlier today, is, is, is also a big deal. Uh, low rank matrix approximation is something that people use, partial evaluation and early exit. All these techniques really uh, come down to one type of activity that we do a lot of in the, in the team, which is an engineering machine learning co-design that I'd like to talk about now. So this is kind of how we approach these problems, and I'd like to do it with a motivating example of these uh, uh, quantization problems. So when you think about quantization, there are a lot of papers about quantization, but really quantization could mean a bunch of different things, right? I mean, how do I, I, I understand that I want to have a few bits representing each number, it's gonna be kind of discrete, kind of integery, but what is the semantics? What's the math that's represented by these bits? So again, binarization is something that was hot uh, a year or so ago. Uh, the bit zero will represent the number minus one, and the bit one will represent the number one, and I want to learn neural networks whose weights or activations are all minus ones and ones, but I could also have zero represent the number zero, so I could also have the weights be zero or one. Uh, when I have a ternary representation, I add a zero, when I have more bits, what do those bits mean? 
Is it just an integer? Do they grow linearly? Are these powers of two that are represented by these bits? Is there some lookup and I basically have a table and I have you know, two to the k different numbers but they can be arbitrary floats. There are many, many different solutions. If you count the different options here on this slide, there may be 60 different solutions. And I can choose a different represent representation for my weights and for my activations. So I have something like 60 square different combinations. And for each one of these, uh, basically we'll go through two types of activities. One, we'll take uh, you know, the engineering head on and say, assume that my activations are represented with repre repre representation A and my, my weights are representation B. What's the least number of instructions on this device that I care about uh, that, uh, to compute a dot product or, or, or a matrix matrix multiplication? And we'll really try to squeeze every little bit of performance out of our instruction set that we have. And now that we've done that, we go and we put on our machine learning head and say, well, I need to also get accuracy, right? So given that representation, how accurate can the models be? And what I wanna show you, and this is what's nice about uh, invited talks, is that I can show you negative results. It doesn't all have to be glossy and wonderful. I don't have to be accepted to anything. Uh, we're, we're seeing a ton of failure here. So um, again, this is our Pareto frontier. These are our optimal models. This is what happens when I do binarization. So I'm not saying that the like the paper on XNOR networks and these other binarized papers are, are wrong, they just applied it to really, really big, fat, redundant models. When you take bare bones models, when you take models that have already gone through you know, two and a half or three years of optimization by a team like my team, this is what you get. You get some loss in accuracy, and then you get a speed up, but it's, you know, you, if, if it would work, you'd get a new point that breaks through your predator frontier. Here, we're just seeing uh, basically uh, failure, and this is after trying to extract the most performance and the best accuracy that we can. Uh, here's another example with ternary weights and 8-bit activations, another one of those, you know, 60 squared uh, combinations that we try to get it to work. Here, it's actually not that bad. You see the optimization kind of hugs the contour of our Pareto optimal frontier, but doesn't give me anything better than I already had with my architecture search and my lossless compression techniques. So we're still working on this. I'm optimistic. I'm hopeful that we'll be able to compress even more and push this even more with lossy compression. But uh, you know, who knows what'll happen. Right now, it's kind of failing. Uh, I don't really have time. Uh, to tell you about a bunch of other stuff we're doing, because I think, uh, I think we're, we're, we're out of time, but we're working on a bunch of different stuff, I can tell you uh, online if you care. Uh, let, me, let me just finish by showing you our little clusters. So one fun thing that we do on our team is, uh, you know, we need to evaluate models on real hardware. And uh, we need clusters, and it's hard to find clusters with these little devices, so we have to build them ourselves. This is our first version of our uh, Raspberry Pi 3 cluster that we built. Now it has about 50 nodes in it. Uh, so this, this is a beautiful professional uh, photograph, but the cluster is, is kind of hacky. They, I mean, we built this in our little hardware shop. Um, this is our uh, Pi Zero cluster. So we have a little mini cluster of Pi Zeros. This is something called a banana Pi. So this has uh, Cortex A7s. Uh, and this is just because every time that we come up with a new compilation optimization, we basically have to take our entire backlog of models that we've trained and run it through this compilation and evaluate, run data through it and see how fast it is. So we need clusters. Um, and, and the last thing is that this, you know, it's kind of made out of acrylic and cables. Uh, we recently built a new PCB for this, so we're gonna build a, a more serious uh, cluster. So this kind of Pepto-Bismol colored board is something that we built. These are just Pi Zeros, uh, but it's a blade. So this is something that we're gonna uh, deploy into our, into our little data centers or into our, into our computer room and have a proper uh, cluster of, of Pi Zeros. So uh, I think that's all I have time for. Thank you very much. So we can squeeze in one question maybe while our next speaker gets set up. So first person to sprint to the mic can ask a question. No one's running fast. All right, here we go. All right, we got our one question. Oh, we lost the slide, man. I was gonna ask a question about the slide. <laughs> yeah, um, go for it. Greg, from, formerly from Baidu. Um, yeah, so thanks for presenting that Pareto Frontier comparison. I think that's the right way of doing these evaluations. Um, clarifying question. It's one of the things that you're saying that um, kind of when you're in the accurate part of that, um, that trade-off that seemed like it was pretty flat. So most of the things, most of those configuration points, it sounded like what you were saying was that most of them would give you a pretty huge speed up because it's so flat. Um, I had an interesting question, like w when, um, 
you're in that regime. What if there's noise? So what if there's noise in your measurement? Um, how do you know that you know, you're not just picking the, the noisy outliers yeah. on the top and, and so, actually getting anything? So first of all, I don't think that it's flat so much as um, I think that the, the, the x-axis should be shown in log scale. Uh, and then it won't look flat, then it'll look like it's supposed to look. Uh, so we just care about kind of the very, very, uh, you know, less than one second per, per frame on these Raspberry Pi. So it's, I think it's okay to show it in linear scale. But I think that, uh, you know, if you think about most papers in this area, they're working on very, very big models that on something as small as a Raspberry Pi, it would take, you know, many, many seconds to process just one input. So it, it, it flattens out. And then if you were looking at it at log scale, it wouldn't, it wouldn't look so flat. And then uh, noise. We're not seeing a lot of noise. So one beautiful thing about working with these Raspberry Pis is that it's a, it's a really nice, stable, standard piece of hardware. Not only that, it costs 30 bucks and anyone can do it, right? So I think that if we're not counting flops, right. but we want to count real wall clock time, having a standard benchmark that anyone can buy off of Amazon.com and it'll run pretty much the same anywhere in the world, uh, I think is, is, is really a blessing. So we're seeing actually very little noise if that's a... Uh... So we see little noise, just to clarify, in the performance measurement on something like a Raspberry Pi. I'm also interested in the other side. Is there noise of in accuracy. the test sets in the accuracy measurement? Right. So again, I think here the important thing is just to be well defined. Here, the, the number that we're showing is just take the image net test set measure top one accuracy. That's a very well defined number. We can argue about whether it's meaningful. But, but you know, that's, that, that's a number that if I measure twice, it's exactly the same. There is no measurement, because I'm not resampling or doing anything. And then because my background is from learning theory, I can, I can agree with you that maybe it's a, it's a, it's a bullshit number, right? But at least, <laughs> at least it's, it's, it's something that we can, we can you know, decide to compete on and see who's doing, who's doing better. Okay, so at least if we're using the same test set, we can do apples to apples comparisons. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I think, yeah. Okay. Thank All right, you. let's uh, thank our speaker again. Cool, thank you.